There's an eerie silence in the thin mountain air. The Roman troops expected an ambush by now. Emperor Theodosius marches with 50,000 men through the Julian Alps, one late summer day in the year 394. He knows waiting up ahead is civil war. Two years prior, the emperor of the western half of the empire, Valentinian II, attempted to remove his domineering general Arbogast from power. Arbogast refused and tore the order to pieces in front of him. Soon after, Valentinian was found hanging in his own residence. Arbogast claimed the emperor had killed himself, but others suspected murder. Regardless, the death of Valentinian meant that the eastern emperor Theodosius now became the rightful emperor of a reunited Roman Empire. But Arbogast objected and installed his own puppet western emperor, Eugenius. And so it is that Theodosius finds himself marching to Italy to reclaim the empire, with his trusted general Stilicho by his side. Stilicho's father hails from the tribal Vandal people. The Vandals, like other peoples outside of the empire, fall under the label Barbarian. While Roman aristocrats likely resent the fact that Stilicho is half Barbarian, to Theodosius, it makes no difference. The audacious Stilicho has risen through the ranks and married Theodosius' adopted daughter, Serena. He now leads the Emperor's elite bodyguard unit through the Alps. This Eastern Roman army is also joined by nearly 20,000 Federati, or barbarians allied with the Roman Empire, including the cunning Goth leader Alaric, who was begrudgingly negotiated to serve in the Roman army after Stilicho crushed his attempts at invading the Empire. As the armies descend from the mountain, Arbogast's massive Western army comes into view, positioned all throughout the valley. Theodosius orders a head-on attack by the Federati, but the Western army massacres 10,000 of them, and Arbogast celebrates victory that night. The next morning, Stilicho and Theodosius lead a counter-attack. A sudden mountain wind whips dust into their enemy's eyes, rendering their archers useless. They splinter Arbogast's front line and capture the enemy camp. Eugenius is executed, and Arbogast escapes alone into the mountains. He wanders for days before finally taking his own life. Under Theodosius, the empire is united once again. His two young sons are to one day be co-emperors, Honorius over the west and Arcadius the east. At the moment, neither are ready to rule, so when Theodosius falls gravely ill that winter, he entrusts Stilicho to be the political guardian of Honorius, should the illness take his life. And Theodosius does indeed die that January. For all intents and purposes, Stilicho immediately becomes the ruler of the West, at least until the ten-year-old Honorius can rule himself. With the 18-year-old Arcadius ruling in the East, the Empire is again divided between East and West. Except Stilicho claims that on his deathbed, Theodosius privately called to him and granted him guardianship over Arcadius too, thus making him the de facto ruler of both the West and East. Whether or not Stilicho is telling the truth is irrelevant. The weak-willed Arcadius already rules under the thumb of Stilicho's rival, a cutthroat Eastern general named Rufinus. Rufinus convinces the young emperor to reject Stilicho's claim of guardianship. For Stilicho, this seems like an issue for another day. He's now the ruler of the West and is struggling to sustain the massive combined forces of Theodosius' Eastern army and the Western army he's just inherited. He dismisses Alaric and the Goths without fanfare or reward. Alaric won't have it. He and his troops ravage the Roman countryside all the way to the gates of the Eastern Roman capital, Constantinople. There he demands a high office in the Roman army. Rufinus pays him off and gives him permission to invade the Balkans and Greece instead. As Alaric begins to ravage cities, Stilicho grows eager to punish the traitorous Goth king. He musters his troops and crosses into the east. There he tracks Alaric deep into the Balkans and cuts him off. Victory is at hand, but at the last moment an order arrives from the eastern emperor Arcadius. Stilicho is to return the eastern half of his army back to Constantinople. Rufinus is almost certainly behind this. After all, a glorious victory for Stilicho would have threatened Rufinus's hold on Arcadius. With his now depleted army, Stilicho makes the journey back to Italy, and Alaric escapes free. The eastern army returns to Constantinople, greeted with fanfare by Rufinus and Arcadius. Then, as the leaders make their speeches, the troops rush the emperor's entourage and hack Rufinus to death. 
Stilico may have organized this assassination, but others believe it was a eunuch in the imperial court named Eutropius. After arranging to have his political enemies exiled, Eutropius quickly becomes Arcadius's new puppet master. Stilico still dreams of a united Roman Empire, and Eutropius stands in the way of that, but barbarian invasions along the Rhine River beckon him northward. Then, Alaric returns. He and his Goths have invaded Greece, raided almost every major city, and sold thousands of people into slavery. So in 397, Stilico hunts Alaric again. His fleet sails to Corinth, but the rescue mission is too late. Goods have been stolen, people slaughtered, and buildings burned. Stilico knows the Goths are still close. He charges at the Gothic army, forcing them to retreat until finally he ensnares them atop a mountain. The battle is over. He needs only to wait until his enemies surrender or starve. News of the battle reaches Constantinople. Like Rufinus before him, Eutropius fears Stilicho becoming a hero in the east. He has Arcadius demand Stilicho leave Greece at once, but Stilicho purposely delays this time. He plans to leave only after he crushes Alaric. Eutropius won't allow it. He declares Stilicho a public enemy in the Eastern Roman Empire, making him an outlaw in the very cities he's trying to save. Eutropius then confiscates all of the goods and land Stilicho holds in the east. Somewhere in this chaos, Alaric bribes his way past some of Stilicho's troops, and the Goths escape down the mountain. Stilicho returns to the west, humiliated. Eutropius has taken his land, his possessions, and his right to rule in the east. And he isn't done twisting the knife. Eutropius offers Alaric a place in the Eastern Roman army as the chief general of all troops in Illyricum, the region directly bordering Italy. Alaric accepts and receives a massive salary and the resources of the Roman war machine. With the world turning against him, Stilicho learns that Gildo, the leader of the western province of Africa, has decided to defect to the Eastern Empire. Africa is Rome's vital source of food. Without it, the city will starve. Eutropius, of course, supports Gildo in his decision to rebel against the West. Stilicho acts with violent haste. He sends Gildo's rival brother, Maskezel, to squash the rebellion. Gildo is captured, thrown in a dungeon, and executed. By now, Stilicho is no stranger to the betrayals, corruption, and assassinations underlying imperial politics. In fact, it's an art form he's mastered. When Maskezel triumphantly returns to Italy and begins to ally himself with Stilicho's political rivals, he has him thrown off a bridge and drowned. Threats to power cannot be tolerated. That includes Eutropius, whose own popularity is hampered by his appointment of Alaric to a generalship and the fact that he is a eunuch, a castrated man. Stilicho has no qualms about indulging in a bit of revenge here. He gives the Western court poet Claudian permission to publicly slander Eutropius. Claudian enthusiastically obliges. In 399, at the pleading of his wife, Arcadius exiles Eutropius. At a later date, Eutropius is recalled, tried for treason, and executed. As fortune would have it, Silico is enjoying new heights in power and popularity, and he receives a correspondence from his remaining nemesis. A humbled Alaric fears a rise in anti-barbarian sentiment in the east, and asks Stilicho for a position in his western army. Stilicho turns him down. In the fall of 401, Stilicho races his troops across the Alps to drive off an invasion of Vandals and Alans, but he leaves Italy vulnerable, and Alaric takes notice. The Goths charge into Italy, ransacking cities and ravaging countrysides. Stilicho is stuck. It's now the dead of winter, and snow blocks the mountain passes back over the Alps. In the coming months, Alaric advances on his prize, the city of Milan, where the Western Emperor Honorius resides. Honorius flees from the gates as they approach, abandoning his city, but Alaric sees his feeble escape convoy and cuts it off. Honorius is forced to take refuge in the nearby city of Asta. Its defenses won't hold long. And in the last, most desperate moment, with the barbarians pounding at the gates, a rescuer emerges. Gallantly flanked by a contingent of his elite troops, Stilicho has trekked across mountains and rivers and broken Alaric's siege. The Goths flee, but Stilicho knows Alaric still wants Rome. 
He tracks the Goths and crushes them in two subsequent battles. The weakened Alaric quietly settles somewhere in Illyricum. It's a few years later that panicked news arrives in Italy. Tens of thousands of barbarian warriors and their families have crossed into the empire. They burn and pillage through Italy with little resistance, led by a new king of the Goths, a man who wants to burn Rome to the ground and slaughter its people. His name is Radagaisus. Stilicho is outnumbered. He quickly forms an alliance with the tribal Alans and Huns against Radagaisus. Together, they track down the invaders and eventually surround them. In the heat of battle, Radagaisus runs for his life, but he's captured by the Romans. Stilicho has him executed. So many of the invading barbarians are sold into slavery that the Roman slave market temporarily crashes. This now marks the second time Stilicho has saved the empire from invading barbarians. But with this shining victory, Stilicho realizes an unsettling truth. His army isn't large enough to defend the Western Empire by itself. However, the aristocrats of the Senate reject Stilicho's pleas for more Roman recruits, as conscription would draw from the population of laborers who currently toil away on their vast estates. The golden age of the Roman Empire has passed. Its senators now place profits above patriotism. Yet Stilicho sees one solution, Illyricum. It holds thousands of new Roman recruits and its currently disputed territory between the East and West. He plans an invasion, to be led by an old enemy, but a capable commander, Alaric. However, before Stilicho can leave, Honorius furiously calls off the attack. Stilicho has overstepped his bounds and angered the Emperor. One court official, Olympius, will take notice and begin to subtly plant doubts about Stilicho in the Emperor's ear. Stilicho has little time to mend this relationship. Barbarians cross the Rhine and terrorize Gaul. Around the same time, a man named Constantine III leads a British rebellion and proclaims himself the new Emperor of the Western Empire. With the backing of Roman Britain, Constantine lands in Gaul, joining forces with many of the invading barbarians. They will conquer most of Gaul and Spain together. In the midst of this civil war, news arrives that the Emperor of the East, Arcadius, has died. His heir is only seven years old and needs a guardian. Stilicho considers this his last chance to unite the Empire and create a combined army capable of driving out Constantine III. But it's risky traveling to the hostile East, especially if it means leaving the impressionable Honorius alone with Olympias. Stilicho ultimately decides not to make the journey, but it's too late. Olympias has already poisoned Honorius against him. He has claimed Stilicho is secretly serving barbarians and wants to place his own son, Eucarius, on the eastern throne. At Olympias' prompting, Roman troops begin massacring Stilicho's supporters. Stilicho knows what's coming. He flees to a church with some of his loyal troops, and at daybreak on August 22nd of the year 408, Roman soldiers arrive on orders from Olympias and Honorius. Only after escorting him out of the church do they reveal that they've come to execute Stilicho for crimes against the state. Stilicho's faithful troops intervene in one last, frenzied attempt to rescue their leader, but Stilicho calls them off. He accepts his fate, and he's beheaded. Eucarius, his son, is then arrested and executed. Stilicho's wife, Serena, will later suffer the same fate. Olympias then has Stilicho's followers brutally tortured in an attempt to squeeze out information that might justify the execution. They profess Stilicho's innocence until the very end, and Olympias has them killed. Olympias then convinces Honorius to purge allied barbarians from the empire. In a manic genocide, the Romans slaughter tens of thousands of the innocent wives and children of allied Goths serving in the military. The infuriated Goth soldiers respond by defecting en masse to the most powerful barbarian king still standing, Alaric. With his new massive army, Alaric attempts to take control of the empire. When this fails, he again demands a high office in the Roman army. But Honorius refuses to negotiate, ignorant of the fact that Stilicho's death has left the Western Empire without its watchdog, without its shrewd general to ruthlessly drive out invaders while simultaneously balancing the interests of capricious barbarian chieftains. So it happens that in 410, Alaric and his army stampede through Italy and drag the empire to its knees. For the first time in 800 years, 
the eternal city of Rome falls to a foreign enemy. For three days, the Goths defile monuments, torture and kill civilians, and strip the city of its wealth. Rome will recover, but this is the beginning of the end. From here, barbarian kingdoms will chip away at the empire's borders, and the east and west empires, once together under Theodosius, will never be united again. Allies and enemy alike are swallowed in the collapsing Roman Empire. Olympius is arrested and clubbed to death on the orders of one of Stilicho's old followers. And Constantine III, who did rule as co-emperor of the Western Roman Empire for a time, is soon deposed, his severed head sent to Honorius. Finally, King Alaric, a few months after sacking Rome, falls ill and dies. These characters, from Theodosius and Eutropius to Alaric and Stilicho, are the actors who introduce Rome's final act. In 476, the western half of the empire falls. The Roman Empire as the world knew it dies, and Europe slowly slips into the Middle Ages. One wonders if Emperor Theodosius might have seen the writing on the wall all those years ago. Civil wars and constant invasions were certainly no sign of a healthy empire. But for a brief moment, for 13 years between 395 and 408, his half-barbarian general Stilicho held it together. So thanks again for watching this video. Make sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell, and consider donating to our Patreon account. We also have a new merch shop that's open where you can get anything from a Stilico mug to a Wild Bill Hickok t-shirt.